new songs and hopes with you This is how we build every day it's Yeah, I need every one of you These dreams we continue with that Thank you for being here. Good evening. Thanks to everyone for being here and to the organizers for having me. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the indigenous territories, the treaty territories that were gathered on here today. Um, I live in Vancouver, which is unceded Coast Salish territories, lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people and nations. Um, and those nations have, have tended to the lands that I reside on for decades and generations and centuries and um, extend my deep gratitude for their ongoing stewardship of the land. Um, so this book that I'm <laughs> here to talk about um, is Undoing Border Imperialism, but before I talk a bit about the book and the movements that I'm part of, I just wanted to give a little bit of background and context as to how these movements became really important for me and my, my personal connection to migrant justice work and specifically to anti-colonial migrant justice work. So my grandfather was involved in the independence struggle in what is now known as India and Pakistan, but prior to that was pre-partition. Um, and so for me, it's always been a source of pride that he's been involved in the freedom movement and fought against the British Raj prior to independence. But also one thing that he was involved in was after partition, um, was transporting people across the border. So people, not a lot of people know this, but the partition of India and Pakistan, which was itself a, a colonial legacy, led to the displacement and death of over two million people. It's an incredibly violent partition and an incredibly violent legacy of a, of a so-called freedom movement. Um, and so there are members of my family that I've never seen because they are in what is now partitioned part of Pakistan. Um, and in particular, while my grandfather was involved in transporting people across both sides of the border, uh, he would often talk about the level of violence that he witnessed. So um, the amount of killings and in particular the really high level of sexual violence and, and rape against women that happened during the period of partition. And so this legacy of, of borders and the violence that they inflict in very real ways um, has, always, has always stuck with me. And uh, not just my grandfather but both of my parents also come from this deep legacy of uh, dispossession and displacement. My father's been a migrant worker for his entire adult life. Um, he's been deported from several countries in the Gulf. Um, I spent time with him growing up in a migrant labor camp, which I won't go into, but if anyone has heard stories about migrant labor camps, particularly in the Gulf, they're horrific. Um, and of course these situations aren't unique, right? Migrant labor camps are horrific everywhere. That was just my specific experience. Um, and my mother's side of the family was displaced from their land in the Punjab um, as a result of the so-called Green Revolution, which was not green and not a revolution. It was a, a land grab by major corporations like Monsanto. Um, people might have heard of the epidemic of farmer suicide, specifically in the Punjab. And so they were displaced from rural areas into the urban areas, right? So these are all patterns of, of displacement from the land um, that are my familial history. And when I came to Turtle Island, I actually spent nine years with precarious legal status. I faced a removal order for nine years. Um, and I spent time in a detention center um, in what is known as Celebrity Inn in Toronto. Um, and that is the epitome of, of Canada in some ways, right? We call our jails and our detention centers inns like they're hotels. And so the detention center in Toronto is called Celebrity Inn. Um, but again, it is a site of incarceration um, and forcible confinement. Um, so that's, that's my, my personal connection to this work. It's deeply informed by uh, my personal experiences, but of course my personal experiences aren't unique, right? These are experiences that are shared um, across generations, across families, and, acro and from so many people um, on Turtle Island and across this world. And my connection in particular to anti-colonial struggle um, is also incredibly personal because when I was uh, facing removal f from Canada. The communities that welcomed me onto Turtle Island was when I lived on the East Coast was communities in Ganawage, and when I moved to the West Coast were communities in the interior, so the Shaquatma communities and other communities. So indigenous communities um, who when, you know, when they found out that I was facing removal were very quick to welcome me into their territories and into their nations. Um, I was deeply honored if I don't know if people know about Wolverine, but Wolverine is a former, po former political prisoner and an elder from the Shaquapmuk Nation. Um, 
and he fought for years for me to have status in Canada. And so for me, the connection um, and the deep responsibility and the welcoming that Indigenous communities have offered to me has influenced the ways in which I understand Canada and Canadian citizenship and belonging and an anti-colonial and also decolonial process. For me, talking about border imperialism is incredibly important because it really provides a framework for how we understand um, borders. Because a lot of times when we talk about immigrants and refugees, we talk about these issues in a very domesticated framework, right? We talk about, is Canada treating migrants well or not? Is Canada treating refugees well or not? Should we accept more immigrants? Should we accept more refugees? Um, you know, even amongst the liberal left, the conversations are confined to the idea of Canadian generosity. We should be treating them better. Um, without, again, any kind of systemic conversation about, well, why do these patterns exist and how do they emerge? So for me, border imperialism is a critical alternative framework to talk about immigration from a much more systemic lens. And that's incredibly necessary because we're living increasingly in a time um, of domesticating a conversation around immigration and really a heightened discourse of protectionism. Um, and entitlement, right? This idea of Canadian entitlement to determine how bodies move and how they're regulated. And so border imperialism connects forces of empire and capital in particular to cycles of displacement and migration. And it doesn't take a lot to make those connections. The reality is, is that the majority of the world's displaced are from the global south, not from the global north. The majority of the world's displaced and migrants come from rural areas, not urban areas. The reality is, is that most of the world's migrants and displaced are brown and black bodies, not white bodies, right? These are not, these are asymmetrical patterns um, that reveal patterns of power. And really at the core of all of these forces is the lived experience of dispossession, right? When we're talking about migration and displacement and all of these forces, at the core of it is dispossession, which is dispossession from land, dispossession from community, dispossession from our tongues. Many of us lose the ability to speak the languages that we grow up with, dispossession from our histories. We have scattered senses of self, um, you know, this constant um, feeling of non belonging and being diasporic dispossessions from bodies, and often dispossessions from our own sense of self and intimacy. And these are deeply traumatic, right? Dispossession is a fancy word, but the reality is that we carry these traumas through intergenerational experiences, um, and we carry them within ourselves as well. And we've seen this um, emerge in really collectivized ways in over recent years. So, you know, over the past few years, we've seen massive protests and riots of immigrant youth all across Europe, for example. So in France and England and other parts of Europe. Um, and what's deeply painful and ironic about listening to some of those youth talk about, you know, why they're on the streets is, you know, they're talking about economic austerity, they're talking about racism, they're talking about all of these different intersecting realities. But in particular, what a lot of them talk about is the fact that, you know, their parents fought for independence in places like Algeria against the French and other parts of the world against, you know, British and colonial, British and French colonial forces. And, are, and now they are the generation having to fight within the belly of the beast against those same kinds of exploitations, right? We also see this within Turtle Island. So displacement and dispossession isn't just happening across state borders, right? Across Turtle Island, we're seeing that the tragedy and the epidemic of the violence inflicted upon indigenous women, specifically with um, the ongoing missing and murdered women's tragedies, is a direct result of dispossession of indigenous women and indigenous nations from their homelands. So in British Columbia, for example, where I live, over 72% of indigenous women now live off their territorial home bases, right? So that forced displacement and forced dispossession that brings women into major urban centers to endure levels of violence and systemic poverty. So what, is, what does migration look like? What is, what's the overall picture? So the International Organization for Migration, as well as the United Nations, so fairly conservative estimates, they estimate that there are one billion migrants around the world. Half of the world's refugees are women, and approximately 45% of forcibly displaced people are under the age of 18. Of all of these migrants, one of the largest growing populations in the world of refugees is climate refugees. Yet we have um, places like Canada 
that doesn't even recognize climate refugees or environmental refugees as an actual category. Um, it's estimated that by the year 2020, there will be 50 million climate refugees. And so we know that the majority of the countries and the places in the world that are being affected by climate change are communities and people that are least responsible for climate change, right? So small island states, indigenous communities, et cetera. And so we have, on the flip side, countries like Canada, who have, you know, we have the tar sands. We have 70% of the world's mining and exploration companies. Where I live in Vancouver is the headquarter of over a thousand mining companies in the entire world have headquarters in Vancouver. And, you know, so you have this reality of Canadian complicity in global climate change, again, both locally and globally, yet Canada refuses to accept climate refugees as a category. Have people heard of the show Border Security? That really horrific reality show? So for people who haven't heard about the show in short, it's a reality TV show. It's much like any average cop show, those awful shows that make cops out to be the good guys and everyone who's picked up is the bad guy. Um, ser you know, really deep issues around lack of consent, so people in very vulnerable positions who are being broadcast on television for um, entertainment, basically. So um, this reality show kind of hit the headlines when there was a raid by CBSA in Vancouver on a construction site, and eight or 12 workers, undocumented workers, were filmed as part of this reality show. Um, as a result of the campaign, one good thing that happened is this uh, episode never made it on air, but this show unfortunately does continue. So one thing about the, the undocumented workers who were picked up, so no one is legal in Vancouver and other community groups were in touch with the workers, their families got in touch with us. And one thing that never got reported on was who these workers are, right? Everyone was concerned about the show. Um, there was a lot of stereotyping, of course, in the media about them being quote unquote illegal workers. But no one really knew how they came to, how they came to Canada. So in the case of three of these workers in particular, they're from El Salvador. And they were from a village in El Salvador where Gold Corp operates. So Gold Corp is one of Canada's most notorious mining giants, um, you know, even being sued in Canadian courts for environmental and human rights abuses. And two of these men were cousins, and their family members had actually been killed in the fight against Gold Corp. So their family members were killed by private security, hired by Gold Corp. Of course, nothing happened in the context of um, Canada or Gold Corp taking any responsibility. And they had other family members who faced severe repression um, as a result of their movement work against Gold Corp. So, you know, when these men fled to Canada, of course, the last thing that they could do was tell Canadian authorities and the Immigration and Refugee Board that the reason that they needed to claim asylum was because they were fighting Gold Corp, a Canadian mining giant in El Salvador, right? And so um, the reality is, is that what happened is that they, um, or sorry, not El Salvador, Honduras. And so um, what ended up happening is they made a refugee claim based on what a lot of Latino refugees end up having to make refugee claims on because that is the narrative that the West loves, which is that of the war on drugs and narco-trafficking, right? Because that is the acceptable framework of violence and crime and disorder in Latin America, not that, you know, again, Honduran people are fighting Canadian mining giants. And so um, their claim was found not to be credible. They had to go underground. They became undocumented. They found themselves working at a construction site for less than minimum wage, find themselves getting videotaped for this horrific reality TV show. Um, so their story, again, you know, represents the reality of so many people, which is that we hear these snippets of people being illegal, people being undocumented, um, people that we're made to believe are, are lawbreakers or are scamming their way into the system or abusing the system, all these stereotypes that we hear without any sense of what their stories are, and more importantly, how Canada and the societies that we live in are actually com very directly complicit in those displacements in the first place. Um, a second example is that of the Philippines. So the Philippines is considered one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. Um, and again, despite being one of the least responsible for climate change, and you know, again, this stands in, in stark contrast to how actively the current Canadian government and, and the Canadian government for a long time 
has very actively um, taken no steps to alleviate climate change and is in fact expediting the process with the expansion of the tar sands and resource extraction in general. Um, and so in the Philippines, eight out of 10 people in a World Bank commissioned survey, so again, these are very official, relatively conservative estimates, eight out of 10 Filipinos have personally experienced the adverse effects of climate change in the last three years, according to again, a World Bank survey. And so, you know, these recent kind of climate-induced displacements, as well as a long legacy of structural adjustment, economic structural adjustment, forced privatization, um, U.S. militarization, U.S. military bases, Spanish colonization, this long history of, of various forces has basically meant that over 10% of the Filipino population is forced to work overseas. Imagine one-tenth of your entire nation and community forced to work overseas. And what that means is over one million people leaving every single year, right? And again, these statistics are immense and they're hard to grasp, but for each one of those one million people, that means family members who are torn apart. That means people who are again losing uh, their connection to their land, their connection to their community, their connection to their language. There are you know, children who are growing up without their parents because an increasing number of migrant worker programs are structured in such a way that they have no family reunification, right? So multiply that times a million. And in Canada specifically, every year, um, there's approximately 36 thousand Filipina women who come to work under the Live-In Caregiver program. So this is just one program. There's um, a lot more Filipina folks who are coming to work in the service sector, the retail sector, um, and, and you know, various other sectors. But specifically under the Live-In Caregiver program to provide domestic labor basically to rich and middle class Canadian families. And so the Live-In Caregiver program is one of many, many, many temporary foreign worker programs. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't call them temporary foreign worker programs, I call them migrant worker programs because temporary foreign worker program, just that language reinforces the idea that people are foreigners and reinforces the idea that people are temporary when in the case of, for example, seasonal agricultural workers, some of those families have been coming here for generations. So in Ontario, you have farm workers who are here for two, three, sometimes four generations and are not temporary at all, right? They're, they're here. Um, so the LCP is one of many migrant worker programs. And as Juliana mentioned, migrant worker programs are currently outpacing the number of permanent residents who come to Canada. So Canada likes to think that it's a country of immigrants where people can come and reside and have the benefits of citizenship, the right to vote, the right to education, the right to health care, the right to EI, all of these different things. But the reality is, is that's, that's not the case. Um, migrant workers, each program is different, um, but in general what migrant worker programs have, particularly low-wage migrant worker programs have in common, is the fact that people are paid less than minimum wage. It's in fact legal right now to be paid less than the prevailing wage in Canada if you're a migrant worker. Um, people are working far more than regular hours, so working overtime hours, often not getting paid for overtime hours, um, no access to health and safety, no right to unionize, right? So an extremely exploitable pool of labor. And this isn't a coincidence, and this isn't an anomaly, and this isn't something that just some employers do. This is a program that is supported and facilitated by the Canadian state. This is a program that the Canadian state and the provinces and every level of government is supporting and touting as the new model for immigration. And you know, one thing that Canadians think is, is that we're better than the United States, right? That's the general narrative across the board on a variety of issues. Um, but particularly on immigration, it's important to note that the United States, since at least 2008, has looked to Canada as the model to implement for managed migration. So Canada, or the United States actually sees Canada as having a good model of immigration, not because migrants are treated well, but because the U.S. government realizes that the best way to handle the quote-unquote undocumented problem in the United States is to start implementing what they call the guest worker program. But the other thing about the LCP that's really important to highlight is that this isn't just an issue of migrant workers. The issue with the LCP is also that it allows the Canadian state to get away with not providing a universal subsidized childcare program. 
right? Because it means that the Canadian government has basically privatized and uh, privatized childcare in such a way that rich and middle class families who are able to afford private domestic labor can pay for replacement domestic labor. And this has also been a huge failure, and it has to be named as such, a failure of a huge segment of the feminist movement. Because a huge segment of the feminist movement actually lobbied for the LCP and saw the LCP as a way for women, again, you know, predominantly rich, middle class white women, to enter the labor force. So this was seen as a victory for women to enter into the labor force. Um, when again, you know, this is an issue of lack of subsidized childcare for all women. So how are poor women, single mothers, women of color, working women supposed to afford an LCP worker? Of course they can't. And it's also, of course, an issue of exploitation of women in the program, right? So the LCP represents um, multiple layers of, uh, of oppression and privatization and domestication of, of specifically feminized labor. And so to me, the LCP doesn't, again, just represent um, a failure of the migrant worker program. It also calls on all of us to realize how we benefit from, and in some ways, how a lot of us also don't benefit from the LCP, because it means that, again, the Canadian government is able to subsidize um, childcare. And so the other issue that's important with, res with regards to migrant workers is to figure out how to develop um, and have a particular conversation around migrant workers. Because you know, increasingly across the board, people are opposed to migrant worker programs. But the reasons that they're opposed to migrant worker programs, or increasingly people meaning the non-right, so everywhere from the center to the left, um, is opposed to migrant worker programs. Um, but the reasons that people are opposed to migrant worker programs are diverse. There's an increasing number of Canadians and as well as labor unions who are opposed to migrant worker programs because migrant worker programs are seen as taking away jobs from Canadians. Migrant workers are seen as stealing resources um, and essentially taking away the benefits of the Canadian populace. And so this is really important to challenge as well because it reinforces the idea that migrant workers are not really from our communities. It reinforces their kind of otherness, right? The idea that they're in the nation state, but not of the nation state. And also it means that the site of struggle is about Canada rather than migrant workers. So rather than being concerned about migrant worker programs because migrants are being exploited, we become concerned about how we as Canadians are losing access to our resources. And so, um, you know, in British Columbia, and Alberta's actually been quite different on this, particularly with the AFL, but in British Columbia, there was recently, just a few months ago, a situation where a number of Chinese migrant workers were facing deportation. And the BC Federation of Labor actually supported the call to have these migrant workers removed from Canada because they felt that, um, you know, there was a, a whole kind of scandal that developed around how these migrant workers were let into the country um, too easily and that regulations weren't followed. But instead of calling for status for these migrant workers, instead of calling for the right for these workers to unionize, instead of calling for the right of these workers to have the right to stay, now that they're here, we ended, we ended up in a situation where union was calling for the deportation of Chinese migrant workers, which is especially um, dangerous in British Columbia because BC has a long history of anti-Asian racism in particular, right, with the, the Chinese head tax and the, the race riots. Um, and this is happening as, you know, a large segment of the Chinese Canadian community continues to be mobilizing around that legacy and calling for a full apology. Um, and the Chinese race riots, the Asiatic, um, the Chinese race riots in, in Vancouver um, was actually initiated by the Knights of Labor, which was a labor organization. So it's further kind of compounded this feeling in people um, that labor unions have not changed, right? That it's gone from actively calling for race riots in Chinatown 100 years ago to calling for deportations 100 years later. And so, you know, what can we do? So what kind of, of analysis and discourse can we articulate around migrant worker programs? And so for me, I think the solution isn't to call for the deportation of migrant workers. It's not to call for the end to migrant worker programs. It's instead 
to realize that migrant worker programs fulfill a particular role within the Canadian economy, and that migrant worker programs globally perform a specific role, right? So migrant worker programs are essentially the flip side of outsourcing. The kinds of jobs that can't be outsourced, that require physical presence of, of labor, so in the retail sector, resource extractive industries, is what migrant labor represents. It's the insourcing of labor. And so in the same way that we would respond to the outsourcing of uh, of labor within uh, you know, the context of a capitalist globalized economy, the way that we should be responding to migrant worker programs is to say, hey, you know, migrant worker programs lower the wage floor for everybody. Migrant worker programs rely on cheap labor as a result of the active dispossession of the so-called third world. Cheap labor isn't, doesn't exist coincidentally. It exists as a result of social conditions. Those social conditions have to change. So workers need to be allowed to have access to all of the benefits that they pay into, right? That it's egregious that workers pay into EI in some migrant worker programs and can't access it. And most importantly, that workers have the right to full status because the lack of status is what fundamentally makes people the most vulnerable. Right? And so that, to me, um, is a much better response, calling on status for all workers, and the idea of solidarity. Right? That the way that we lift up the wage floor for everybody is not to um, act as if though the people who are vulnerable workers don't exist and just chuck them out. The way that we lift the wage floor for everybody is to actually do that, make it possible for people to have higher wages so that they can no longer constitute a pool of exploitable labor. So moving on from um, the situation of the Philippines, <coughs> I want to give two more quick examples. Um, the first is the situation in Afghanistan and Iraq. So Afghanistan and Iraq are where the world's current most largest recent populations of refugees come from. And there's a, a total of 4.7 million displaced people in Iraq and Afghanistan right now. And these are recent numbers, so this is a direct result of for example, well, most obviously, the military occupations within both of these countries and of these countries. And the majority of the people of these 4.7 million people, displaced people from Iraq and Afghanistan, are actually going into neighboring countries like Pakistan and Iraq. Yet at the same time, in you know, places like Canada um, and the United States, as well as Europe, we have this intense border panic about how many people are coming to the border. Um, the reality is, is that less than 0.01% of the world's displaced population comes to Canada. Um, and you know, 80% of the 4.7 million displaced Iraqis and people from Afghanistan are going to Pakistan and Iran. Um, you know, and the thing that's important to highlight here, again, is that you know, US, NATO, Canada are directly implicated, of course, in the military occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan. So we're directly responsible um, for this, these displacements. And if we were to believe the rhetoric of places like the United States and Canada and wanting to help Afghan people, wanting to liberate Afghan people, wanting to rescue Afghan women and Iraqi women, we would think that Canada and the US would um, take steps to ensure that displaced people were welcomed. Um, anyone want to venture a guess the average number of Afghan refugees welcomed into the United States in one year? Out of 4.7 million? Um, about 100 a year or less. 328. <laughs> yeah, which is, you know, again, nothing with respect to the large numbers of displaced people, and even more offensive when considering the direct responsibility in creating those displacements. How about Canada over eight years? More or less the same. Yeah, 2,000 over eight years. Pretty much the same, a little bit lower. <coughs> so, you know, this is, this is the reality of, of border imperialism. Um, yet at the same time, you know, in the same way that we see how feminism has been implicated in, for example, the LCP program, fe uh, feminism is also deeply implicated within 
the occupation and the displacement of Afghan women, um, as well as racism. So, you know, we know that, for example, one of the justifications given for the occupation of Afghanistan was this feminist rubric of rescuing and saving Afghan women, um, which, you know, Gayatri Spivak calls an old, a very old white supremacist civilizing crusade to have white men save brown women from brown men. So this isn't new, it just takes different forms. Um, so, and so, you know, we see the ways in which feminism, again, becomes implicated in, um, in oppressing women of color in particular. But this isn't just happening in the context of oppressing Afghan women um, over there, or the justification for the occupation of Afghanistan. It's also actually happening within Canada. So in Quebec, people have heard about the Charter of Values debate. So the Charter of Values debate in Quebec, which was, um, you know, this supposed secular debate, but it's really just a, a veneer for racial profiling and racism. One thing that was really stark about this was that um, while at the kind of peak of the Charter of Values debate in Quebec was a number of women centers in Montreal actually held a press conference because they saw a spike in racism in their women centers. So women who wore the niqab or the hijab and who were accessing women centers in Quebec were actually spat on by other women who are accessing women's centers in Montreal. And so we see how, you know, again, this kind of, of racism, and in particular, the contours of racism that are marked by a, a supposed feminism, um, is really a pillar of border imperialism, right? So racism gets justified internally within, within the West, as well as globally. And it becomes a key way in which to enforce this idea of people of color as eternal outsiders within the nation state, and people of color as not deserving of humanity in general across the world locally and globally. Again, you know, this, this, white, this white supremacist kind of ideology to civilize is also the inherent project, the colonial project of Canada and settler colonialism, right? So the deliberate targeting of indigenous women's bodies, um, you know, since colonialism, two things like the Indian Act, two things like child apprehension is an ongoing project that has a very specific gendered, racialized um, dimension to it. And, you know, it's really important especially to talk about child apprehension because there's an increasing conversation, not enough, but increasing conversation about the legacy of residential schools, the last one which only closed in 1996. But we absolutely don't hear any conversation about child apprehension. And there's actually far more children, indigenous children, who are in state care than ever were in residential schools. And child apprehension is the exact same legacy. It's loss of land, loss of community, loss of language, tearing a part of the, of the nation um, and of the family. And so again, this is, this is ongoing. It takes different forms and shapes and discourses, but the intent and the impact is exactly the same. The final example that I want to share um, is NAFTA. So most people have probably heard of the impacts of the 1994 North American Free Trade Agreement in terms of um, the economy of Mexico, right? And as a result of the systemic, deliberate impoverishment of Mexicans, we've seen over, and this is a, a lowball estimate again, at least 1.5 million farmers and Mexican peasants who were forced to migrate into the southwest of the United States. And this is, you know, this ongoing kind of quote unquote Mexican problem, undocumented problem in the United States. But one thing that we don't, again, often talk about and we don't realize how deliberate this is, is that the same year that NAFTA was implemented, Operation Gatekeeper was actually implemented. And Operation Gatekeeper was a project and an operation that poured billions of dollars into securing the US and Mexico border. So high tech surveillance, um, increased border patrols, um, and you know, basically the fortification of the US-Mexican border. So it's not as if though the United States didn't predict that NAFTA would lead to massive displacement, right? So it's not as if though imperialist powers and economic powers don't realize that these kinds of economic policies of privatization, structural adjustment, um, and completely unfree trade um, creates these kinds of systemic forces of poverty. And the number of, um, people that it's estimated have died crossing the border since the implementation of NAFTA is 6,000. 6,000 people. And Isabel Garcia, who works in Tucson at the, in the border region in Arizona, says, quote, we never thought that we'd be the, that we never thought that we would be in the business 
of helping to identify remains like in a war zone and here we are, right? So this is a, a really high intensity violence that occurs at borders and as a result of borders. <coughs> and also, we have multinational corporations, specifically American corporations, making a killing not only as a result of NAFTA in places like Mexico, but also making a killing fortifying the border. Um, as, well as, as well as Israeli companies like Elbit, right, who received a massive contract um, to fortify both the apartheid wall in Palestine as well as the Mexico-US border. And border deaths, so border deaths like the ones that occur at the US-Mexico border or places like the Canary Islands, or even border deaths that occur in Canada. So for example, when the MV Sun Sea came and the Ocean Lady, the two boats carrying Tamil migrants arrived in Canada. Um, it wasn't widely reported, but it was reported that two people died making the journey on the MV Sun Sea. They died um, making the three month trek on a boat from, um, from Sri Lanka to the west coast of British Columbia. So these kinds of border deaths, when they're talked about, um, it's basically blamed on the victims, right? So it's blamed on people for taking, for example, precarious routes. So in the United States and Mexico, people are blamed for going through the desert as if though there's any other option other than going through the desert. Um, and this kind of victim blaming really is similar in lots of ways to the ways in which um, society, specifically the ways in which patriarchy justifies rape culture, right? So the ways in which when we're talking about rape and sexual violence, there's an intense focus on the lifestyle of women and gender queer and trans folks, um, or on, on the attire that people are wearing, um, rather than an actual focus on why are rapists raping, right? What are the conditions that are creating sexual violence? And the same when we're talking about border deaths and immigrants and migrants who are dying at the border, it ends up being a focus on, well, what route did they take, right? Why, did they, why didn't they pack enough food? Instead of these borders are creating violence. People are forced into situations where um, they're having to take these so-called high-risk um, journeys. And you know, in addition to the fortification of borders, criminalization of migration is, of course, occurring within our borders. So in Canada right now, especially under Harper's prison plan, um, so people have probably heard about Harper's prison plan, um, you know, so the fact that we're increasing prisons even though there's a decreasing crime rate, so how are we gonna fill these prisons up? It's gonna be filled up with communities of color, black people, indigenous people, homeless people, sex workers, et cetera. Um, street involved youth. One of the largest expected growing populations of provincial prisons is estimated to actually be migrants. So right now already in Canada 25 percent of provincial prisons is actually filled with migrants. Um, and the thing that's important to note about migrant detention is that it's completely arbitrary. You don't have to be charged with anything and it can be for an indefinite amount of time. So recently, a number of stories came out from the Lindsay Detention Center in Ontario where some detainees had actually been held for over 10 years. And their conditions are, ho are so horrific and their length of detention is so long that they're actually asking to be deported. Right? So imagine that. Imagine when your only choices are to stay in detention or to actually ask for your deportation as the only choice, supposed choice you have left. Um, and under Obama, um, actually, Obama has actually detained and deported more migrants than any other U.S. president, with last year actually the number of deportations crossing over two million people under, um, under his rule. And so, um, you know, with incarceration of, of migrants, how, how do we justify migrating people for not having actually committed any so-called crime, right? The crime is already a construct and, a, and a, a problematic construct, but specifically in the case of migration, the government doesn't even have to allege any kind of wrongdoing. The only crime is literally the crime of trespassing a border, right? So the border becomes this entity in itself um, that has supposedly been violated. Like the border's not a person, there's no crime committed against a border, but we're so socialized to believe um, that illegal immigrants have broken the law because they've done something wrong. When in fact, when we interrogate what that means, it basically means that people have crossed a border um, without maybe following all the ridiculous rules 
um, that they're supposed to, right? Or like in the case of the guys from Honduras where they actually have no option because Canada doesn't recognize climate refugees and Canada doesn't recognize refugees who are fighting Canadian corporations. And we saw this, you know, with the, with the MV Sun Sea and the Ocean Lady, again, the boats that came in. And the entire news stories were filled with front pages, I don't know if it was this intense in Alberta, but it was in British Columbia, front page news about, you know, all of these migrants being terrorists, all of them having broken the law, all of them being connected to LTTE. And it's frightening how quickly people absorb that logic. How can over 500 people, before anyone knows anything about them, be brandished in such a way? And how do we believe that? Why do we believe that? Why do we so quickly buy into that without, again, you know, before they've even landed on the shores, we're supposed to believe that Canada knows that they're all terrorists. Like, that just defies logic. Um, and, you know, other things too. So this idea, the other thing that was thrown out about these migrants was that they were all trying to um, sneak their way into Canada. And again, it defies logic that 492 people on an open boat are somehow sneaking in. Like, you can't miss a massive boat, right? Like, you're not sneaking under some forest or something. Like, you're pretty visible. Um, you know, and again, under international law, the right to asylum is protected. There's a recognition that people who are fleeing persecution often have to take boats um, or often have to, you know, come with um, passports that are forged. That's a reality. And again, it's an internationally protected right. But that's not the discourse that we hear. Right? What we hear is the opposite of that, and we believe it. And so, um, you know, that's, that's the narrative of, of illegality. That's how we create illegals, is by believing that people have inherently done something wrong just by being. Right? Because that is what the crime of being an illegal immigrant is. It's not of having done something, it's of being. It's of being a migrant who is criminalized for trespassing a border. That's what it is. And so, you know, through all of these different examples, we start to see how displacement and migration is not only manufactured through processes like colonialism and economic imperialism, but also that it's managed, right? So not only is the West creating and manufacturing these kinds of displacements and migrations, it's also managing them by creating detention centers, by fortifying the borders, by saying that if you're a refugee, you can't come in, but if you wanna work for really cheap and be exploited as a migrant worker, you're welcome, right? So we're managing how people are accessing the nation state. And so, again, then we all become implicated, right? We become implicated in a Canadian economy that's basically stolen labor on stolen land. And this is stolen labor at a global level and stolen land at a local and global level, right? So of course, we're on occupied land. We're also stealing land in massive land grabs all across this world. And we're also implicated in stolen migrant labor as well as stolen labor abroad, right? Sweatshops, for example, Joe Fresh, right? The Bangladeshi workers and those um, tragedies that are not tragedies, they're, they're human made. And so, um, you know, this is, this is the reality of, of border imperialism. And so how do we respond to, um, to these flows of, of migration and displacement? So for me, that's why talking about border imperialism from a systemic framework becomes important so that we're not talking about immigrants and refugees, again, in really domesticated frames. So we're not talking about immigrants as if though they only are worthy of their labor, or that we're not talking about immigrants, which is what we're seeing, right? So now, the stories of immigrants are generally negative, unless they're contributing to the economy, or unless there's some like heroic model minority who has you know, broken all barriers and is you know, now the mayor of Calgary or something, right? Um, and so those are, those are the stories and the framings where immigrants become acceptable, the idea of the model minority. And everyone else, that undesirable class, if you will, is also based, based on systemic hierarchies, right? So you're not desirable if you don't speak English. You're not desirable if you're a senior, right? Because you can't contribute to the economy. Um, which is why we have a moratorium on grandparents' sponsorships now. You're not desirable if you have a criminal record. You're not desirable if you can't perform in the wage economy. So if, for example, you know, really ableist notions of labor. Um, you're not desirable if you're a single mother, 
right? You're not desirable if you're racialized, if you're gender queer, all of those things. So we're, by, by determining who is desirable and who's, under, and who's undesirable, we're reinforcing really deep systemic hierarchies within our own communities. Um, and we're forcing the ideas of desirability to be based on what the state and capital dictate. Right? So basically, if you don't represent capital and you don't represent cheap labor, you're something that we absolutely don't want because you don't provide anything to us. Right? It's about the benefits to us. And so instead of that kind of vision, what no one is legal articulates is this idea that no one is illegal, right? That we can't divide migrants based on what they provide to the economy or to capital, but that human beings are inherently valuable, that everyone has something to contribute, that everyone is worthy of dignity, um, and that we can't reinforce this core assumption that migrants are only valuable if they are able-bodied, if they are English-speaking, if they are white, um, you know, or otherwise represent whiteness, if they're without a criminal record, if they're employable, again, if they're not single mothers, et cetera. Um, and it's to really challenge those core assumptions. And challenging those core assumptions is central because displacement and migration is so bound up in race and empire and gender and capital and colonialism that in order to subvert all of that, we have to emphasize that human beings are inherently worthy of dignity, right? That is the only way that we can challenge um, these systems. And so the vision of No One Is Legal in Vancouver in particular is, quote, <clears throat> we envision and actively strive for a humanity where everyone has the right to sustenance and the ability to provide it, where we are free of oppression, misery, and exploitation, and are able to live meaningfully in relationship to one another and in reverence to the earth that sustains us. And so for us, um, that's a much more expansive counter to border imperialism. So what I want to um, end on is just talking very, very briefly. I'm not going to go into it because talking about groups can get very boring. Um, but it's to talk a little bit about what I think the possibilities of movements like No One Is Legal are. Um, I don't want to suggest that No One Is Legal is the only movement out there. It's just a movement that I happen to be a part of, so it's the one I can speak to. But there are obviously lots of other amazing um, anti-colonial migrant justice movements out there, especially, uh, especially at, a, at a global level. So for me, um, the things that are important about No One Is Legal and lessons that we can draw on for really any kinds of movements is, you know, the first that No One Is Legal is rooted, um, and what does that mean? So for me, the idea of being rooted means being rooted in the communities that we're organizing around and about, right? So um, No One Is Legal is rooted in migrant communities. So No One Is Legal in Vancouver, for example, has a membership that's entirely based on people from migrant backgrounds <coughs> and or racialized backgrounds, and also importantly, predominantly women and trans folks, right? Because it's important to lift up the leadership um, not only of people of color, but specifically of, of women and queer folks and trans folks within our movements. And um, so that, that idea of being, of being rooted is really important. Um, and also then taking leadership, right? Taking leadership from communities that are directly affected. So some examples of uh, a second piece that I think is important about No One Is Legal, which is um, being relevant. So being relevant is being effective, right? So it's important to have movements that are effective at what we do. Otherwise, we may have the best of intentions, but people aren't really going to be inspired or we burn out and we get jaded. Um, and for me, the thing that has made No One Is Legal the most, has made it effective at what it does is twofold. One is that um, No One Is Legal hasn't shied away from constantly naming root causes. Um, like the ones that I've mentioned, has consistently named root causes around migrant justice issues. And that's something that movements struggle with, right? A lot of times groups and activist organizations hesitate to name root causes because we think that if we do that, we're not going to meet the people in the middle, right? That we're going to scare people away. Um, and that's a problem because in our minds, you know, who is this average Joe? Like, is average Joe the white middle class guy? Because if we're talking about racism, that's the person who's going to be turned off by talking about racism, for example, right? So um, we have to challenge our own assumptions of who this average person is. Um, 
but also we, so for me, it's a moral question, right? It's a moral question of, um, of always being consistent in naming root causes, but it's also a strategic question. Um, and I'm increasingly convinced that it's really, really important for strategic reasons to name what the root causes of, of the fights that we're involved in are. So specifically capitalism, colonialism, and oppression. <coughs> and oppression. And if we just look at the past year, there's lots of historic examples, but if we just look at the past year at movements like Idle No More, or we look at the Quebec student strike, or we look at the boycott divestment sanctions campaigns, these are all movements and campaigns that have been very clear in articulating root causes, right? So Idle No More, you know, there, initially people were talking about the bills, but we know that I don't know more is about indigenous nationhood and talking about Canada's colonial reality. We know that the Quebec student strike wasn't just about um, lowering tuitions or free education. It was about a much deeper conversation about neoliberalism and commodification and social services and public goods, right? And um, with the boycott divestment sanctions campaign, we know very much that that is a deep analysis around Israeli apartheid. It's not just about the wall, for example. It's about right of return and Israel as an apartheid state and the entire structuring of Zionism. And so these three campaigns have not only named root causes, but I think it would be fair to say that they have been incredibly effective at mobilizing people. Right? The people have been captured by these movements precisely because they name root causes, not despite the fact that they name root causes. And I think that's incredibly important. And so No One Is Legal similarly um, has maintained um, a root cause analysis of migration. Having said that, it isn't just about naming root causes, right? It's about also mobilizing people and attaining concrete victories. So of just a few examples um, of known as legal victories was that in 2002 um, in Montreal, where one of the first known as legals was started, was a number of Algerian refugees, approximately 1,000 Algerian refugees, non-status Algerians, were facing deportation. Um, and they were all facing deportation at the same time because a moratorium to Algeria was lifted all at, w at once, so people faced deportation collectively. And you can imagine the process of organizing as non-status people, right? So people who are living underground, people who are living with a high level of precarity, coming together to mobilize and become incredibly visible in public. And um, hundreds of Algerian refugees organized over a year, or more than a year, but particularly um, condensed and heightened over a year through lots of different ways, right? Petitions, lobbying, um, direct actions, occupations, forums, workshops, conferences. A um, few families took sanctuary in a church. Um, there was actually a direct, a there was also a women's and children's committee of the non-status Algerians. Um, and there was a number of direct actions, one in particular of the liberal immigration minister at the time in Ottawa. Um, and the non-status Algerian refugees who occupied the immigration minister's office, it was a, you know, a non-violent civil disobedience action, were actually tasered, um, and they had dogs set on them. So the police officers barricaded, when the police came in, the cops barricaded them in and set dogs on them. So a number of men who were, who were occupying, non-status Algerian men who were occupying the offices, came out with dog bites, um, and Mohammed Sharfi came out with a, um, a taser burn right on his head, on his skull. And so we see also, of course, the ways in which the state responds to people who are non-status and people of color and men of color in particular, right? It looks very different, um, you know, than folks with more privilege who are occupying an office. That isn't the kind of response that is often ignited um, or incited in other cases. The last thing that I want to mention, and um, this will be quick in terms of the importance of uh, no one is illegal, which is the idea of um, being responsible and being real. And so the idea of being responsible, like I mentioned, is partly being responsive to migrant communities. It's also the idea of being responsible to indigenous nationhood. And so as was mentioned before, one of the things that Known as Legal um, has spent a lot of time doing is prioritizing relationships, specifically as migrants of color with indigenous communities and this idea of anti-colonial struggle. Um, and it's has taken many, many forms, and I won't go into all of them, um, but it's, it's looked like solidarity in a lot of different ways. But the one that I, I do want to mention really quickly 
is just read from a, a quick statement which was developed um, around the time of Idle No More and it was under the framework of immigrants in support of Idle No More. And it reads just in part an excerpted quote, enduring decades if not centuries of colonialism, empire, racism, impoverishment, violence and displacement, many of us have struggled to find stability and to make homes here on Turtle Island. But we recognize that our homes are built on the ruins of others. With humility and gratitude, we affirm our solidarity and support for the sovereignty not of the illegal Canadian government or its immoral laws, but of those communities and indigenous nations whose lands we reside on. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of more work that makes the, you know, this isn't just a statement or a vision, um, but it provides the framework from which people can start to understand the ways in which No One Is Legal approaches this organizing. Um, and if people are interested, I can talk more about it later. But um, the two other pieces around being kind of responsible and, and real have to do with um, also our internal organizing, right? So a lot of times in movements, the main reason we're burning out or that people are leaving our movements is not because we don't know what's wrong, it's because our movements are organized in such a way where we're not being real about the ways in which we're internally structured. And the reality is, is that the internal structuring of our movements manifests in the kind of external political work that we do. Um, and so for, for us in particular, it's been a, an, a huge emphasis on looking at the ways in which our internal structure is focused around labor. And the reality is, is that in a lot of our communities and in a lot of our movements, there's a deep gendered division of labor that we don't name. And that gendered division of labor is specifically around emotional labor and community care, right? So the fact that our movements cannot sustain themselves if we're not taking care of each other, it's a really basic thing. Um, that our relationships is what sustains us. It's not the theory that's going to sustain our movements. It's the relationships that sustain our movements. And how do we nurture those relationships? How do we take care of each other so that political activism is not something separate from our lives? Right, that our political organizing has to encapture all of the aspects of our lives. Right, so when we're going through grief, when we're going through trauma, when we're going through celebration in our personal lives, that our comrades and our allies are part of that process with us. Um, and also that that division of labor can no longer fall predominantly on women. Right, because the invisible work of sustaining our relationships falls predominantly on women, right, and emotional laboring work. And so talking about structuring of labor within our movements and relationship building within our movements is something we have to be real about, right? That's the process of being real um, about how we relate to each other. And so um, where I want to end is by um, maybe just letting Jason Kenny kind of um, talk about the relevance of, of no one is illegal. So Jason Kenny is the well, former immigration minister. And so he, for several years, he has a hate on for a lot of people. The Tory government obviously has a hate on for a lot of people doing um, you know, progressive social justice work. Um, Kenny took it upon himself several times over a period of two years to denounce no one is legal publicly in parliament. And so what uh, Jason Kenney said one of the times in Parliament about No One Is Legal is that, quote, No One Is Legal is not simply another noisy activist group, but hardline anti-Canadian extremists. And so um, for us, you know, when, when the Tories come out and denounce organizations, a lot of people write responses where they're like, this is slander, we're not really like this. So I think this is probably the only time where Jason Kenney and No One Is Legal agreed, because we responded by saying, that's right, we believe No One Is Illegal and Canada Is Illegal. So um, <laughs> I'll just end it with that, so thank you. This is how we feel every day, dreams and poems with you, songs and hopes with you. This is how we feel every day, everyone